We can't even see anything, do we? Okay, let's go a little way down, okay? Let's go, let's go a little way. We just want a clearing where we can see the ledges. Now, this is so overgrown. Okay, so we've like trekked through the bush. Um, trying to find uh, a particular murder scene at the weir. And this in the 70s, when I was a child, was an extremely popular swimming hole. And uh, there was a big damn wall, and we called, called this the weir. We used to be able to just walk down a dirt track all the way down there. And on that side of the weir, um, one night, it was a moonlit night, uh, it's where they uh, murdered the 12 year old that I saw abducted from, it's either Heathcote Road here or something that looked a lot like it. And they, um, I was in the back of a car and they abducted uh, a 12 year old girl who was walking by the road. She was wearing red and white, you know, sh um, t-shirt and, and shorts. She had long brown hair. I just remember she had long brown hair and pretty girl. And when we stopped over to talk to her, she knew them. And they I was in the back right-hand passenger of, uh, side of the car and she jumped in the back left and um, they handed her some candy. I think it was laced. And this poor girl, uh, there was about... Oh, I can't remember. There's a group of men circled around her in, in robes. But a lot of them were priests from uh, Ingerdeen Boys Town and um, various people and what they did was um, they hang this girl to death on the ledge and then they sodomised her and as they sodomised her dead body um, the, the remaining men sta stood around masturbating and I saw all of this and then they, th they made me think they were throwing her body in the weir um, and then I, I can remember being frightened of swimming. My father used to make me swim across the weir. And um, there used to be like a little, I don't know, some sort of motor pump house or something on this side. And I just have this image of going, oh, I just don't want to touch any dead bodies. Like while I'm swimming, because I, I didn't like murky waters. And to this day, I don't like swimming in waters where I can't see what's underneath because of this experience. And I remember swimming across, because this happened when I was uh, six. And I remember swimming after that, not long after that, and thinking, oh, please don't let me touch any dead bodies with my toes. I just don't want to touch any dead bodies. And I remember being terrified when we used to come as a family and swim here. We swim here all the time. So they, you know, they sodomised her. Um, and then the next uh, thing I remember, seeing her body, her body was transported to Holsworthy Army Barracks. And it, um, we went through a side gate um, on, off Heathcote Road and we were met by um, Chan. He seemed a lot more powerful than just someone who was in the reserves. Uh, my experience of him was and, and that girl was... Well, I'll talk about that when we get to Holsworthy. I just remembered as we're climbing up the hill, I forgot to tell you about Stephen who... Um, he raped me also on that ledge. So while those men were busy with the... And Peter Holozak was there. He was one of the ones raping her. But while they were doing all that, this guy who fancied me pulled me aside, a pedo, and uh, raped me violently. And I, I had to relive all that in the police statement and I really had to detail it for the first time in my life. And that was an unsanctioned rape. I wasn't to just be touched by anybody. And he paid for it with his life later on, when I was about 14. He was um, burnt at the stake. No, he was bashed to death at the dog breeder's house. He was tied, tied to a stake, bashed to death, and. So all in all, rather nasty experience. She has a voice. Um, she is articulate. You wouldn't know it to speak to her, but in her writing and, um, you know, she gives other people a voice and she does it well. I'm not stopping for some stupid reason. I mean, I can't stop. I'm compelled to keep going. This is not just about me. This is about a whole bunch of victims that are not here to give voice themselves to what they experience. This is not just me. I represent a whole thousands of people behind me, babies and adults and children and whatever, right? And I'm very conscious of that. 
and to see the pain and anguish she's in is not it's not something you put on so that the, those reactions are real this is Holsworthy Army Barracks it's one of the side entrances uh, on Heathcote Road this is the sort of entrance that I was um, taken into the army grounds via um, it's through the side entrance that I was picked up by I was collected by like those jeeps you see in MASH on the TV show MASH um, those army sort of jeeps with the big backs on them with the, the canvas flaps I was met by an Asian well recruit named Chan and apparently he's the only Asian at the time that was in at Holsworthy and he was supposed to be in the reserves. He was a vicious serial killer. The, the girl that was murdered at the Weir was, um, brought, quick, was brought here and Chan collected her body. She, in the end, um, ended up in the military freezer and I was uh, abused by Chan and other officers in sort of makeshift camps on the army grounds. It was distressing to say the least. And we better get out of here because someone's just pulled up. Let's go, Shane. Children haven't seen daylight. They're trapped, they, they held her down on the uh, fifth level under Holsworthy. And you said that they said to you, they're waiting for the light man. Yeah, they told me that they used to um, get visited by the light man. What does that mean? Um, they described him and, uh, and I turned around and I said, oh yeah, I know him, you know, that's, that's Jesus Christ. They didn't know him or his name, they just, mm -mm. No, those kids are the worst memory of all. I've seen some bad shit by those kids in the cage and I was made to bond with them and uh, spent a few days in a, in, a, in a cage with them in the dark and you know, they'd be sitting there like a captivated kindergarten audience, you know, and I'd be teaching them about, you know, what's up, so up there. And I was only little, what was I, six? Like was I was telling you at East Mulwollumbah, where they were sticking sticks up handicapped girls' vaginas while the teachers masturbated and they've done nothing about it. You tell me where the reality lies in all that. Hurry up. I'm scared. <laughs> Those military police might be going through our car. You got it. Come on, Ray Martin. Welcome to my parish. This is the head church in the Sutherland Shire diocese for satanic ritual. This is a marble altar, a step up from St. John Bosco. Um, marble floor, very easy cleanup of blood spillage. Uh, I attended multiple, multiple rituals here satanic ritual abuse. Uh, I've seen multiple people murdered on this marble slab. Um, so we're at Regina Coli Catholic Church in Beverly Hills in the Sutherland Shire, a suburb south of Sydney. Um, you'll note the eagle, which is a predominant symbol. Features, it's also representative of the phoenix, um, the whole order out of chaos theme etc. Dating back to Horus and from uh, ancient Egypt. I, I well remember that window. That, uh, I think there's a crypt beneath this one, um, but I, I don't know how you get there. So this was the one that was brought, uh, attended by um, Dr. Mark Acker, Leonis Petruscus and um, various people around the Sutherland Shire, uh, various police officers, lots of priests, uh, the priests who worked here at the time. 
This church was actually founded by a relative of Father Paul Evans, who was convicted of pedophilia at Boys Town. Um, there's strong ties between this church and the American military, uh, which is indicated by various emblems uh, on the front of the church, on the windows. So this is where we came for the real big sort of, what do you call it, sort of, I don't know, regional, regional ceremonies. I was made queen bee of this diocese in, when I was about 14. Not something to aspire to. I mean, yeah. How freaking obvious can it get? Look at the eagle. What's that got to do with the Bible and the biblical Jesus Christ and biblical Christianity? What has this got to do with Christianity? Nothing. It's got everything to do with Satanism. That's all I'm saying. She was just different. They didn't know how to handle her. Mm. She, she, there was no one like her in our year at school. Mm. Have you met anyone like her since? Uh, no. <laughs> I have to say no. <laughs> that's, that's really normal for gifted kids to have that. It's, you know, it's not all fabulous. Mm. And that's something it's hard to convey to people. So. You know, you have that isolation, that, that natural isolation starts at around primary school where you where you're where suddenly your interaction with other people has, you know, this meaning in this secluded environment and there's all of a sudden there's a sort of social construct that you're and you're finding your place in that. She was so sharp. Really, really sharp. Very intelligent girl. Now the effect that has for a lot of people when they meet her is that, um, actually there's probably two, two aspects. One is this mirror effect. When people get to know her, they can't play their games with her. And that's, so for, for, for people who like to play games, for people who've got things to, I don't know how to say, things to hide, but they're trying to present themselves as one way when they're not really that way. Um, they will get, they will find themselves very uncomfortable with Fiona. Mm. And Fiona will pick that up and she doesn't like it. Mm. And she won't, she won't say I don't like you to the person, but she won't, she doesn't like people who do play games and people who are pretending to be something they're not. And her reaction to that is it's not anger or whatever, but she'll provoke them. She'll say something, she'll put them in a, talk to them about something, put them in a situation where they have to look at that. You know, what game you're playing. If, you, if you're gonna play this game, then you're gonna get, they end up feeling very awkward. This is Kurnell. Um, we're at the Caltex oil refinery. Um, I was brought here when I was nine with a group of about 10 children. We were placed um, in front of one of the factory furnace ovens and one by one they threw the children in the ovens. They made me think that I was going to be next and I tried to stop them from burning uh, a good friend of mine that I'd grown up with. These are kids that were just bred for, bred in secret for use for this purpose and for sex slavery. Yeah, I was roughed up for trying to stop them and, and I was made to think I was next, but I wasn't, it was just to traumatise me. The encircled pentagram sign on the Caltex symbol is, is, is no accident. There's only one way you get become that rich and powerful. That's by compromising. To gain that power, they will sacrifice people. They'll all seek, seek a supernatural power in some way, whatever way they can get that power. But that's, that's the very basic bottom line. It doesn't matter what you want to call it. I mean, I can, I could, I could take a victim so far, but I, how are you going to deal with the spiritual side of all of this? You know. So you see it as an essential ingredient, the spiritual side. Ah, uh, it's, yeah, it's the main ingredient. If you're baking a cake, it's the flour. That's something you encounter daily, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of. And you know, they don't, they don't fully consciously acknowledge that it's there. But once you start seeing it, it doesn't stop. I understand K 
coven. I mean, the old traditional one that everyone understood was a witch's coven, which um, is a lot more prevalent than what people would like to believe, I think, exists. But then you have, I think, as I understand it now, I might be wrong, but I think it's, um, I consider an occult group to be a coven. Occult as it can come under many, many names, but there's always uh, like a, a mystery religion aspect to it. Now, I think I have come to face to face with many types, whether you want to call them Scottish Rite ones, um, bikey ones, Hare Krishna ones, you know, there, there's so many. Um, and I just see a coven as um, a group of people, any description, and they have a, a hidden aspect to them. All right, well, we're at Kurnell. It's a peninsula. Um, there's heaps of little beaches and coves and things around here. Um, we're losing light, so we can't find the beach, but uh, I remember distinctly a beach that was, um, I was taken to as a kid by Dr. Mark, Aka Leonis Petruscus. Um, and when I was taken there, I was, um, I was told to dig up a body and uh, I dug up a, a body of a little boy who must have been about five and had blonde hair. It was in this area. Uh, there's a very prominent uh, <laughs> pedophile politician was there and he wanted um, Leonis to uh, cover for the, the death. This is a politician who's into necrophilia and uh, he's often been portrayed as the undertaker by um, newspaper cartoonists because I think people know what he's into. I think it's one of the major magazines said that he used to like to go over to Thailand to have sex with little boys. Well, this fellow likes to have sex with dead little boys. And I know because I saw it to traumatise me because that's the whole point of trauma-based mind control is to re-traumatise the victim to keep their um, trauma-based programming intact. So I experienced lots of traumas and this was one of them. And I overheard a discussion between this politician and Dr. Mark Petruscus um, about how they're going to fabricate the death of the child uh, which was probably, uh, I don't know how he died, you know, asphyxiation or something. But um, there was talk of a blue ring doctor puss sting. And I, so I don't, I don't know what was worked out or whether that was what they uh, used as a, to cover or I'm not sure. But we've, I know that the researchers behind this doco since found out that Petruscus wrote a, uh, published an article um, to do with um, the a death in Papua New Guinea of a five-year-old, well, the stinging of a five-year-old girl um, who uh, got poisoned by a, a conefish. So it was certainly an area that uh, Petruscus was familiar with and having studied tropical medicine at Sydney Uni, uh, he was familiar with poisons and all that sort of thing. That's one thing I experienced down here. Another thing I experienced down here um, when I was a young child was um, uh, a nurse that worked with uh, Leonis um, in the daytime she uh, was used as a honey trap for a surfer she seduced him and promised him sex and then he was I think he was drugged and and the guy had like curly blondish hair and I saw him uh, ritually sacrificed to, to Moloch it was a fire ceremony that night and that's what they like to do. They like to burn people alive. And they did it somewhere around here. I mean, it's so, uh, it was very secluded back then. Uh, Sydney wasn't so populated, you know, 30 years ago, uh, 30 plus years ago. So this was a, a, a popular site for 
the coven members to murder people and dispose of bodies without being detected. And they just get the local cops who are involved with them or local doctors like Petruscus to, to cover. Anyway, and I, I wrote to the New South Wales coroner and I said, look, I've, my researchers have just found out the true identity of Dr. Mark, he's actually Petruscus. And I said, every birth certificate and death certificate that that man ever signed now needs to be investigated because everything that man did should be treated as suspicious. And they responded, oh, we can't do anything without um, being directed by the New South Wales Police. So I forwarded their response, their written response to the New South Wales Police Commission. I said, could you please direct these, the coroner to investigate these, you know, these documents that Petruscus has fabricated to my knowledge. And I, I made a big list of all the murders that I remember that he, he wrote death certificates for or was involved with in some way. That's the reality, folks. I've had to fight very hard to have my, the crimes I witnessed and, and was subjected to investigated. Well, they happened, and they happened here. <laughs> Australia, where the bloody hell are you? Buried. Um, I have often described her as crazy. <laughs> this this week, you know, talking to different friends, I've, I've said I've got my crazy friend coming down to stay with me this weekend. <laughs> but she's crazy in a good way. Fun crazy. So, so I dared to ask Neville Davis, do you think he may be Asperger's yeah, so he hog or autistic? Him to means of so he hog ties him to prove to me that he's not because he should be screaming his lungs out by now if he's autistic. Yeah because a normal autistic kid would be screaming their lungs out by now and he thinks that this is a big joke and a big game. So we're in there in the dark and it was very intimate and it gave me an opportunity to talk about everything with him. It was a, it was a lovely experience actually and it's just one of the most privileged experiences of my life. Talking about all this deep and meaningful stuff and this is a child who I only knew as my friend's son. You know, like really? And the place was just crowded. It was packed, full of cops and uh, dignitaries and councilmen and the mayor and um, priests from St Stanislaus College and, and just the local churches. So I'm up there and Mark says, you're, you're up. So I come down here and everybody's watching me. These, these curtains were pulled back and at the back of the stage was a huge banner, the ritual banner, and it was huge, big silk satin banner. There was an altar a big altar erected in the middle here and I was made to lie down on the altar and Bruce Spence raped me on the altar. That was that part of the ritual. So I'm, what am I, 15, turning 16 at this time. And this was all happening during the time of the Bathurst City races. So the massive crowds here are disguised by the thousands and thousands of people and dignitaries and politicians that pour into Bathurst during the races. On stage are uh, Bruce Spence, who's a crap actor. He's been in Dim Buller and Mad Max. There's Richie Benno, our Australian sporting legend who was captain of the Australian cricket team. He's dead now. There's John Avery, police commissioner, New South Wales police commissioner at the time, John Avery. There's uh, Kim Beasley Senior. And then there's, a, there's an obese red-headed woman who had red, long, oh well, about here, long red hair. You know, there was a microphone here like this sort of thing and, and Beasley's, uh, sorry, Beasley's the main one, but it alternated between Benno and Beasley. But they had a real wry sort of manner about them and they spoke very, they had a similar demeanour and um, just mocking humanity. And they, so Beasley was up commentating. <laughs>